Hey guys, this is Nick and this is your Linux and open source news fix for the first half of August 2021. We have a ton of stuff to cover in this one, including the newly announced PineNote e-ink tablet, a lot more coverage of Steam Deck prototypes, or Apple announcing that they will look into the pictures their customers upload to the cloud. Now speaking of a cloud that doesn't look through your stuff, let's begin with a word from our sponsor, Linode. So Linode is a fantastic way to get your own Linux server up and running. It was rated the easiest cloud provider to use on G2, and it has been voted top infrastructure as a service provider by G2 and TrustRadius. Linode offers a ton of one-click deployable servers, like Owncast for example, which lets you run your own Twitch-like streaming service complete with video broadcast and chat, or Apache Guacamole. What's that you ask? Well, Guacamole is a fantastic way to get your own Linux desktop in the cloud that you can access from anywhere you want. And basically you can host that on Linode and get to any other computer and get access to that Linux desktop. It's pretty amazing. If you're more into gaming, you can also deploy your own Valheim or Minecraft server in one click. Linode has a ton of these one-click deployable apps. I use Linode to run my own Nextcloud server, which I use to run this whole channel, so I can't recommend them enough, especially since you can now create your account easily using Google or GitHub. And in the future, if you don't have a credit card, you'll be able to sign up using Google Pay as well, so that's one less barrier to get started. So if you want to get a free $100 credit to start your own Linux server, well, head over to the link in the description below and click it. Okay, let's begin for once with the open source news. And the Free Software Foundation will fund white papers to study the philosophical and legal questions around GitHub Copilot. If you've missed the news around that, Copilot is some kind of AI tool that crawled open source code and will generate code itself to help developers write their stuff more quickly. It has raised questions around the license of this generated code and the ethical issues that surround that process. So the Free Software Foundation judges Copilot as unethical and unjust, but they also want to clarify more questions, like is Copilot infringing on copyright? How can Copilot comply with free software licenses? Or should the FSF argue for change in copyright law to cover this new use case? Submissions for white papers are open until the 23rd of August, so if you want to study this interesting development, start writing. KDE Gear 21.08, the latest update to the collection of KDE apps, has been released. It includes tons of improvements to most default KDE applications. The highlights are in the file manager, Dolphin, with a revamped hamburger menu that only shows the most important options and lets you display a menu bar if you need one. You also get animated previews of what a folder contains. Console, the terminal, now has previews of files when hovering over a file name, and you can open these files just by clicking them. Gwenview, the image viewer, has moved to the hamburger menu as well, although here as well you can go back to the menu bar if you prefer. You'll have to wait for your distro to ship these updates, but I already got them on KDE Neon, so it shouldn't be far off. Now onto some Linux news. AMD and Valve are starting to work on a new CPU scheduler that should offer much better performance, at least on AMD hardware. A CPU scheduler manages the CPU frequency according to the kernel and processor status. It's basically ramping up performance, up or down, depending on what your system needs. The current scheduler is based on an old CPU freq driver that's been in the Linux kernel for ages and it's not providing the best performance for modern AMD architectures. So they want to focus on this to improve gaming performance with Vulkan and VKD3D, but it should definitely also help performance and maybe better ally for all other tasks. So it's going to be an interesting development to follow. Linux has also passed the 1% market share threshold in the Steam hardware survey. This might seem very small, but Linux was under that bar for years now, and it's seen a sharp rise in the last month, probably due to the announcement of the Steam Deck. I would guess more Linux users decided to answer the survey, or more people tried out Linux and Steam on it to see what the experience might be. We'll have to wait to see if that market share keeps increasing or just falls back down, though, because it could be temporary. In general, Linux is quantified at around 2.4% on the desktop, at least by StatCounter, which uses browsers' user agents. Now, it looks like GNOME might soon get a website to showcase applications made for that desktop environment. In a blog post on GNOME.org, Sophie Herold explained that this might be easier for users to find apps that will look at home on GNOME and make contributions even easier for users who want to reward developers for their work. And it could all be automated, thanks to a bit of scripting. 
This reminds me of the web version of the Elementor OS App Center, which is also a nice way to look at the various app options you have on that desktop. It's a great initiative, and I hope we will see that soon. Debian 11, codenamed Bullseye, has been released as the latest stable version. It will be supported for 5 years and brings in GNOME 3.38, Plasma 5.20, XFC 4.16 or Mate 1.24. The team also mentions there are 11,000 new packages in this release, but as always, stable versions of Debian are meant to be really, really stable and they don't ship the latest releases of most of these packages, desktop environments or kernels, so only use it if you need a very stable production environment. The Pine64 continues to expand their range of devices with the newly announced Pine Note. It's an e-ink tablet with a 60Hz refresh rate, an unconventional 1404 by 872 resolution, it has pen input support and 16 levels of grayscale. The panel is covered in glass and it has a front light for reading at night. It will cost $399, it has a quad-core ARM CPU, 4GB of RAM and 128GB of eMMC storage, and it runs Linux, of course. This device is, as with most first announcements from the Pine64, a very early development device, so the interface and the various use cases won't be fully fleshed out. But I would expect the developer community to be able to do really good things with this. I would love a Linux running quality e-reader to replace my Kindle. Now let's move on to some application news, and there are plenty here. Lutris has seen a new beta update, which now supports Epic Game Store games. You will find this option as a source, just like Steam, GOG or native Linux games. And once you're logged in, you will see all your Epic games and be able to install them and run them. Of course, they are all Windows versions, since Epic doesn't have native Linux games at all, but this simplifies the process of launching them, if you didn't already move to the Heroic Games launcher for that. It also now has options to enable DLSS or AMD Fidelity FX Super Sampling, Dolphin and Steam for Windows are also available as game sources, and DRM-free services like GOG or Humble Bundle can locate existing installations of games, among other improvements. This cements Lutris as one of the best places to gather all your games on Linux. It's just an amazing piece of software. Firefox has lost 50 million users since 2018. This information comes from the Firefox data report and is highly concerning. While Chrome and Chromium-based browsers dominate the web on desktop and on mobile, and Safari has carved a niche for itself on the iPhone and the iPad, Firefox has kept falling lower and lower to the point where Microsoft Edge might now have passed its market share. So while some of you might not care, I personally feel it's really important to have a diversity in the browser engines that we have. A monopoly on that front, like what is currently happening with Blink on Chromium, is not a good thing for the open web. If one company gets to decide how the web works, then we're facing an IE6-like situation. I don't know what Firefox can do to get more users, but I really hope they find a competitive advantage, and soon. Crossover 21 is now out. If you don't know about Crossover, I made a video about it a while ago, it's basically a commercial implementation of Wine. This new version bundles Wine 6 and DXVK 1.7. Now, the main advantage of Crossover is the support. If an app that is shown as working correctly stops working, you can get help from code weavers to solve the issue and get your program running again. And of course, contributing to Crossover funds Wine development. The new version doesn't grab the all latest versions of Wine and DXVK, probably for the sake of stability, but it should be a sizable improvement over the previous release based on Wine 5. Mosai is a brand new app that's basically Shazam, but on Linux. No, not the weird kid turned buff superhero, the song recognition app. You basically have a listen button, which you press, and the app will try and detect which song is playing in the background and give you a title and links to listen to it on various platforms. It uses the odd D API, which means you won't be able to use it too many times a day, but you can apparently register your own API key with them to get more. It's a pretty cool application, and since we don't have anything that fills this space on Linux, as far as I know, it's a welcome addition to our app roster. Firefox 91 was released with a new privacy-related feature, something they called Enhanced Cookie Cleaning. By going to the settings, you can now view for each website you visited its so-called cookie jar, which is basically a container with all the cookies this website has stored. You can empty this cookie jar per website if you have strict cookie protection enabled in the settings. 
In the history panel, you can also right-click a website and select forget about this website to remove it from your browsing history and delete all cookies associated with it. Now let's move on to some gaming news. Valve talked a bit about their decision process leading from the Steam machines to the Steam Deck, and it's an interesting watch. They explained that they started to work with partners to bring their vision to life, but ended up realizing that they really wanted to start using their own designs and prototypes to solve user problems. This led to the Steam Deck as the culmination of all these previous ideas. They also talk a bit about Proton and how the Steam machines just didn't work because there were very few games available. Then they decided to follow down the Proton road to get stuff up and running and be able to approach developers and tell them that their stuff already works so they could focus on supporting the hardware itself. Now speaking of the Steam Deck, the early reception to the first prototypes seems to be pretty good. Linus Tech Tips, The Verge and Adam Savage got some hands-on time and they all seemed pretty thrilled by what Valve has accomplished. Games run well, the device doesn't get too hot, the controls seem to feel really good to use and the desktop mode already seems to work pretty well. All in all, there weren't many negatives leveled against the device, which is really encouraging, especially considering that Valve still has about 4 months to polish it up and fix any issues they encounter. I can't wait to get my hands on mine. And finally, Wine 6.15 was released, with more libraries converted to the PE format, more 64-bit conversion work for NTDLL calls, and more work on the GDI syscall interface, which is the interface Windows apps use to display graphical elements on screen. 49 bugs were also fixed, including for some anti-cheat systems like MRAC anti-cheat or BattleEye, and for games like Hitman 2 from 2018, Little Nightmares, Resident Evil 4, Civilization 4, Gridfall, Final Fantasy XIV Launcher, or Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. And let's complete this video with some privacy news, Apple got called out after they announced that they would start looking in their users' phones for child sex abuse photos. A lot of people thought that Apple would start looking at and access every picture you take and store, and were rightly outraged at the notion. Apple has since clarified their position. Just like other tech giants, like Google or Microsoft, Apple will only look for the specific print of some photos listed in the child abuse photos database that is shipped directly on device. They are not rifling through your phone, they are basically just comparing hashes, if and only if your photos are uploaded to iCloud. And only if your account passes a threshold of 30 known child abuse photos will human moderators intervene and look at these specific pictures to confirm that they are indeed illegal stuff. Joanna Stern has a good article and interview on the Wall Street Journal that I feel kinda makes the whole thing a non-issue, but I will let you make your own mind about that. So this video was made possible by Slimbook. If you don't know about them, they're based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux laptops, desktops, they have all the keyboard layouts that you might need, they ship worldwide, and their stuff is really good quality. I only use their desktop and laptop these days, and even their keyboard. They're top-notch. So if you need a new Linux running computer, head over to the description and click on the link. I think you'll find something that you like. So thank you guys for watching this video, if you enjoyed it, don't hesitate to like or subscribe, and if you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. If you want to help support me do what I do, you can also join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members and you'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. And if you really don't like YouTube, you can also watch my stuff on Odyssey. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!